Go everybody, find a seat. Quiet down, please. Okay, we're going to bring the meeting to order. The Public Safety and Security Policy and Finance Committee start out with a roll call. Representative Cornish. Here. Representative Johnson. Here. Representative Hillstrom. Here. Representative Becker Finn. Here. Representative Considine. Here. Representative Dean. Here. Representative Frankie. Representative Grossel. Here. Representative Howe. Present. Representative Lomer. Representative Lucero. Here. Representative Newberger. Representative O'Neill. I'm here. Representative Pinto. Here. Representative Ward. Representative Zerwas. Okay, entertain a motion to uh, approve the minutes of March 7th. So Representative, Representative Pinto or Dean? Representative Pinto moves the minutes for March 7th. All approved, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, folks, we're going to move through the instructions kind of quickly. Um, we're going to hear two bills today. Both bills will be laid over for a possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Uh, I plan to give the author and the testifiers an average of 15 minutes to present their bills. Uh, I understand they plan to take about 10 minutes to present uh, 188 and 20 minutes to present uh, 238. Next, we'll take public testimony. Uh, because the list of the people uh, the sign up is very long. We're only going to get as many, we're going to get as many of them as possible. To do so, we've got to limit the testimony to two minutes apiece. So, if you've brought along pages to read from, uh, we're going to have to stop you wherever you are at the reading at uh, two minutes. We'll be taking time here, and we'll adhere strictly to the two minutes apiece for both sides. Um, we're going to have about an average time of about 25 minutes, and we won't be adding to the list that's already signed up. There will be a number of you that have Make sent requests, yeah. email or otherwise, that we won't be able to get to. Once we get through our list of people that have previously signed up, uh, we are, are going to stop taking uh, public testimony. I know that will disappoint some of you, but that's the only way we could do it or we'd be here for or three days for for both sides. We'll take questions from the members um, after the public, or this, see, that's right after the public testimony. Right? After the public testimony, we'll take uh, questions from members for about 10 minutes. Um, since the bills are being laid over, we'd ask the members to hold <coughs> off on any comments or speeches that can wait when it comes up again. If included in the omnibus bill, there'll be plenty of time for that. Uh, we do plan to complete testimony and lay these bills over before session begins at 12.15. One thing I'd really like you folks to do is that both sides, no booing, hissing, clapping, approval or disapproval. Just let, it cuts into both sides' testimony. So uh, once we get going, uh, if we could just keep it respectful and have both sides. The way it works out, we're actually probably going to get a little more time for the opposition than, than the proponents. Representative uh, Hillstrom, are you okay with this procedure? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, we agreed that uh, we would be willing to uh, hold our questions on this side in order to allow the public to have more time to testify. So uh, we'll be doing that later. Thank you. First one up is uh, House File 188, Representative Nash, and uh, I will move House File 188 to be laid over and in possible inclusion into our finance or public safety uh, omnibus bill, I should say. Representative Nash, you have, uh, you want me to move the uh, amendment to get it into the shape you'd like? Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee. Yes, uh, I would appreciate if you'd move the amendment for me. Okay, the amendment sh should be in your packet, the A17-0168 amendment to get it into the shape the author would like. Uh, the author, the uh, chair will move that amendment. All in favor say aye. Right. Aye. <coughs> Opposed? No. Okay, the bill is in the shape you'd like it. Uh, go ahead, uh, Representative Nash. Well, again, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, I wanted to, to thank uh, a couple folks before we begin. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Speaker Doubt and Chair Cornish for helping us get this scheduled uh, at this time that we have had from the very beginning. I wanted to thank out, uh, thank a few other folks, our friends from the NRA. I wanted to thank uh, the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. I wanted to thank our friends at Gokra, longtime Minnesota-based uh, uh, folks who have been helping us here uh, with gun issues uh, here at the Capitol for a very long time. And, and members, I, I, I wanted to take just a quick second to say that, you know, there you've probably been a hearing or been approached by another organization that uh, 
is taking credit for getting this hearing uh, scheduled. And you know, I, as the author of these two bills, uh, I'm always happy to meet with everybody. And I've met with many of you uh, hearing your concerns. And I, I just have to say that I've never uh, met these folks. They've never come to my office. And, and I'm just kind of curious. Uh, uh, they're called, uh, uh, I think they're uh, Minnesota Gun Rights. And I, I'm not, I have yet to meet with them. So just wanted to make sure that that got on the record. But uh, I believe we're taking up House File 188. And I want to set the parameters for what we're talking about today. Uh, it's uh, House File 188 is a bill that modifies our existing permit to carry a firearm statute three specific ways. Uh, it introduces what's called constitutional carry or permitless carry into Minnesota law. Under this bill, permits to carry would become optional within the state of Minnesota. Any individual who currently is allowed to own a firearm and carry a firearm under our existing law would be able to carry that firearm without a permit. It's important to note that individuals that are prohibited from owning a firearm or carrying a firearm today would still be strictly prohibited from doing so under this new law. Domestic abusers would not be able to own or carry firearms just as they cannot under today's law. Convicted felons would no longer be able to own or carry firearms just as they can't under today's law. All other prohibited persons would not be able to carry or own firearms just as they cannot under today's laws. Individuals could still follow the current process to obtain a permit to carry and many do. Uh, so because this allows them to carry reciprocally in other states and can be used in lieu of permit to purchase when purchasing a handgun or certain long guns. Secondly, House File 188 creates a penalty for carrying a firearm, firearm unlawfully from a gross misdemeanor to a felony. A prohibited person carrying a firearm in public is committing a serious offense. Increasing this to a felony recognizes the seriousness of that offense. And finally, House File 188 modifies the existing approach to negotiating and solidifying reciprocity agreements with other states by requiring the Department of Public Safety to pursue such agreements with other states as required for reciprocity reasons with other states. Uh, as we move into testimony, you're going to hear a lot of information from both sides. And I ask you to keep an open mind. Listen carefully to the facts from those that have spent years studying these issues and ask questions based in fact. So uh, we do have some testifiers. I would like to bring them down and I believe you've got the, the list, uh, Mr. Chair, as to who we're going to call down. We have a Mr. Scott Roush, uh, National Rifle Association. Come on down, sir. Mr. Chair. Representative Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If you could just tell us who's on deck so they can be ready so we don't take a bunch of time waiting yeah. for folks that might be uh, in the overflow room. A uh, good idea. Uh, Good morning. Thanks yeah. for being here. Rob Dorr will be up on next. Go ahead, Mr. Roush. Good morning, Chairman Cornish and members of the committee. And thank you for taking public testimony on House File 188. First, I want to acknowledge the chairman. I understand a few groups have stated that you are being <coughs> pressured into holding this hearing. I want to make it absolutely clear that this hearing is being held at the request of the chair and is completely within the timeline that was laid out when I first met with Representative Nash and uh, Representative Cornish at the beginning of this session. Uh, so I thank the chair for his, for his leadership uh, that he has shown and the willingness to hold this hearing today. Why does NRA support bills that will enact constitutional carry? That question is very simple. We as an organization and our thousands and thousands of members across Minnesota believe an individual should not be required to pay a fee or obtain a government issued license or permit to exercise his or her constitutional right to carry and possess a firearm. It is that simple. It is a fundamental right. We have fought and won this fight in 12 different states across the country, with New Hampshire being the latest to sign their constitutional carry bill into law just two weeks ago. Minnesota's neighbor to the west, South Dakota, is expected to enact their law in the coming days as their legislature just approved this bill this week. Around 20 other states are pursuing constitutional carry legislation, including your neighbor, Wisconsin. The trend of enacting constitutional carry legislation is occurring across the country, and the NRA fully supports Minnesota's efforts that are being led by Representative Jim Nash. Again, I thank the committee for holding this hearing I look forward to a productive and respectful debate, debate and I thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Dorr, are you up? After Mr. Dorr would be Fred 
All right. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, Representative Nash, uh, members of the committee. My name is Rob Dorr. I am the political director for the Gun Owners Caucus and uh, the uh, also a permit to carry instructor uh, here in the state of Minnesota. Um, the Gun Owners Caucus were an all volunteer organization. Uh, despite being uh, referred to often as the corporate gun lobby, we've uh, never received a penny from gun manufacturers or the NRA or, or any other um, uh, you know, gun. Uh, industry and uh, our members uh, we're all member supported and all volunteer so just to point that out um, like I said I'm a permit to carry instructor I own my own training organization and it is a, it a little bit odd it might seem odd to you it certainly is odd to me that I would be here advocating for constitutional carry which would cut out a significant portion of my business's uh, profit uh, from permit to carry classes but uh, I do value our constitutional rights uh, the issue of constitutional carry uh, has been extremely contentious but it's actually trending towards the norm as mr. Roush just pointed out uh, 12 states have passed constitutional carry and uh, five to six more expected this year and then another dozen or so within the next few years that's uh, this is where the momentum is going um, What's important to realize is states like uh, Vermont have never ever had a gun bill uh, are a limit on the exercise of the right to carry. Um, the crime rates in the states that have passed constitutional carry, uh, their rates have remained flat or even uh, crime rates, uh, firearm homicide rates have remained flat or decreased. Uh, there is no correlation that's been noted between constitutional carry and increased um, homicide rates. <coughs> I'm sure many of you will recall prior to the passage of Minnesota's carry law, uh, there was rhetoric that blood would be running in the streets and there would be a shootout over parking spaces. Um, on the carry law, uh, the director of Protect Minnesota at the time said, we are talking about increasing the gun violence in our state. Uh, we have almost 15 years of data to show that that's not the case at all. Uh, in fact, murder rates and violent crime rates have fallen dramatically uh, since uh, the passage of our uh, carry law. You're going to hear much more of this rhetoric today. <coughs> Uh, organizations that have opposed, opposed every single proposal to advance the, law, the rights of law-abiding gun owners will be here and we'll talk about how horrible things will go uh, if we recognize Minnesota's constitutional right to keep and bear arms. Uh, just remember, we've been down this road before and the sky hasn't fallen. Uh, you will hear words from the late Justice Scalia that will be taken out of context uh, in order to fit their position and will be ignoring the entirety of his arguments. Uh, you will hear uh, cherry-picked statistics and surveys, often funded by Michael Bloomberg or other anti-gun organizations, which have been called into question by numerous ac academics. Uh, this kind of statistic meddling um, that you'll see uh, often includes uh, Instead of just talking about gun homicide, they'll include uh, justifiable homicides, ones where the, the shooting was considered justified, uh, police uh, self-defense shootings, as well as suicides. Uh, in Minnesota, suicides make up about 80% of our gun deaths, which is tragic, uh, but the correlation of a person's right to carry and suicides, it, it just doesn't follow. If a person can legally own a gun, they should legally be able to carry it. Uh, you'll likely hear a reference to a 24-year-old survey that says 40% of gun sales happen without a background check. That survey has been uh, fact-checked by Washington Post and has been given four Pinocchios every time it's mentioned. It's just simply uh, an ina inaccurate survey. Uh, you'll hear a claim that this bill eliminates property rights. Uh, that's false. Where you can carry today, you'll be able to carry under this bill. What's prohibited, what's a prohibited place today will be prohibited under this bill. Private businesses, home Owners, private organizations will all maintain their ability to set their yeah, schools. They will all maintain their ability to set their own policies uh, regarding carry uh, within their private businesses. We respect private business owner rights. You'll likely hear complaints about the definition of public place under this bill. Uh, one opponent has publicly stated this bill defines public place in a way that we've never seen before. Uh, that's also false. In reality, the definition of public place in this bill is copied from current statute. Um, you will hear uh, about the number of permit holders who have had their permits revoked or voided. Uh, that number is 243 over the past 14 years. That might sound like a high number, but it actually equates to uh, five one hundredths of one percent of the law abiding permit holders uh, in Minnesota. Five one hundredths of one percent have had their permits uh, voided or revoked. Um, you will hear about supposed crimes committed by permit holders. The BCA is required to keep track of crimes committed by permit holders. 
shoulders. Uh, these crimes uh, don't matter whether they use a gun uh, in the crime or not. So if they just committed a crime by nature of being a permit holder, they're agreed. Uh, they're agreeing to being tracked uh, by the BCA. These crimes include uh, traffic violations, forgetting to renew your tabs, or writing a bad check. Uh, you'll hear that this bill will allow anyone to carry a gun for any reason, uh, and uh, likely a reference to the permit denials. But what's important to realize is that nobody who would have been denied a permit is authorized to carry under this bill. Anyone who's a convicted felon, a domestic abuser, or has committed any crime that makes them ineligible from possessing a firearm in state or federal law is prohibited from carrying under this bill. Furthermore, as Representative Nash pointed out, this bill increases the penalty uh, to a felony level for a, a person who is carrying unlawfully. Uh, just as if any other law in our state, it is incumbent upon the citizen to make sure that they are abiding by the law. Um, and finally, you will hear concerns about training. I must say that it is interesting to me to see organizations that said the training was insufficient and would lead to blood in the streets 15 years ago, uh, now saying that removing this training would lead to blood in the streets. Uh, just remember, we've been down here this road before and the sky hasn't fallen. Uh, in, uh, including the states with constitutional carry, 26 states issue carry permits with no training requirement at all. Uh, so as you would expect, expect the sky has not fallen. Uh, there's no correlation between firearms training and public safety. But what has been uh, shown uh, is the association with, tr uh, with um, the association with fees and training uh, prevent uh, cause a barrier of entry uh, for those uh, who are less privileged, uh, those in the middle and lower classes. So it's as an actually, it, uh, it's actually not time. The two minutes doesn't apply until the public testimony starts. We're just winding up now, so please keep it. The, uh, as an instructor, a second. Oh, sorry. when I read out the instructions, I said 15 minutes, and it took us a couple of minutes to introduce him, so he's right on 15 minutes now. So it's just the instructions I read to you a little while ago. You want to finish up now? Yep, I, I, yep I'll finish up. So as an instructor, I firmly believe that every person should have as much training as they can afford. But training and government fees should not be a prerequisite to the exercise of self-defense or of a constitutional right. So I urge you to vote for this, uh, or to encourage you to support this bill as it's uh, being considered. Uh, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Doerr. Uh, the first one we have on the list, uh, I think there's about 10 people here, is uh, Fred, and rather than pronounce your name, would you come up and from Burnsville? Yeah, What's that? It's okay. Come to the, uh, and the next one behind you would be Reverend Nancy Nord Bentz, Executive Director of Protect Minnesota. So if you want to get ready to go. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, Good morning. sir. Morning. You have two minutes, and when we uh, I ask for time, <coughs> please abide by it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Committee. Um, my name is Fred Gerster. I live in Burnsville, Minnesota. What I wanted to do today was discuss a few areas where people can look and, and find facts about uh, such type things. One is the 2011 FBI Crime Table 1, which is the 20 year summary with 10 violent categories. It's down every year, every category for 20 years. Current levels would need to increase 200 to 300 percent in all 10 categories to reach the 1992 levels. That's how much crime has gone down. When we take a look at a state by state and where these things have gone down, it's the states that have done conceal and carry, castle doctrine, reasonable gun laws. We also need to look at uh, a national reprocessity. If you can carry a gun in your home state, you should be able to go across state lines and not become a felon. If you take a uh, plane trip and wind up diverted into New York City, Baltimore, uh, DC, uh, Chicago, or, or uh, California, you can become a criminal now because you've, you've landed there without, in many cases, an unregistered long arm or short arm. Uh, I also have a chart in the information I'm going to leave that's homicide rates from 1985 to 2012. We're now at 100 year lows. And the reason again is because of the American gun owner. They stopped 2.4 million crimes a year. And even the Obama study of 2013 and the Florida study now concur that they do stop well over 2.4 million crimes a year. In addition, the 88,000 crimes per year they said uh, the government claimed for many years was a gross uh, error. I also want to say that in addition to the American gun owner uh, helping, when we look at the homicide rates, and I also have that in here, it's also grossly uh, increased because it includes 400 police shootings, 
260 legal castle doctrine type shootings and probably somewhere between 1,500 and 3,000 non-castle doctrines. Okay, if you could wrap so, up. Thank you much, sir. Okay, thank you. I sure appreciate it. Thank you. And folks, if I realize some of you disagree completely with what folks are saying on both sides, so but try to keep it to yourself and not uh, approve or disapprove. Okay, after uh, the Reverend uh, Chief Paul <coughs> Schnell will be next if you want to get ready. Reverend, go ahead. Hi, I'm Nancy Nord Benz. I'm the new executive director of Protect Minnesota, and I really appreciate uh, Mr. Doerr spending so much time giving our arguments. I'm just going to um, really react to a couple of things he said. One of them was 200 some denials of permit requests. Um, I have here for each of you a printout of the permit request denials in your own districts. Um, in the last 10 years. Protect Minnesota looked at the BCI um, stats. We discovered that 364,000 people have applied to carry a, a permit to carry gun in, in Minnesota since 2006, between 2006 and 2016. Of that, 98.8 percent of them were approved. So in, the, in that 10 year period, 359,830,000 Minnesotans got permits to carry. So I don't think we can argue that this is onerous, that it's making it difficult for people to get permits to carry since nearly a, you know, over a third of a million people have done that in 10 years. Each of you here has a packet of the permit denials in your district that they gave reasons for. And I'm, we're gonna make sure you get that. I want to point out that some of them are very small. Eight of you are in this little packet. Um, Representative Constantine has the, had only three permit denials in his district in that 10 year period. Uh, but hey, this is Eric Lucero, this is Deb Hillstrom, this is, um, thank you, Representative, Lucero. thank you, Becker Finn, this is Representative Pinto. He broke my printer, he had so many. And this is Rep Representative Joanne Ward, who had the most. I think we need to recognize that what's good about our current permit to carry law is that if you live in a part of the state where uh, there's not a high population, there's not a high crime rate, there's not a gang influence, you might have very few people that don't get their permits to carry approved. But if you live in parts of the state where gangs are an issue, where crime is a much more significant issue, there are many, many thousands, 4,300 4, people in the state right now that have been denied permits to carry okay. who would be able to carry. Thank you so much. Thank you, you so ma'am, for being here. Next up, Chief Paul Schnell, followed by um, John Plotz, if you could get ready. <laughs> Chief, welcome. Right Thanks for being here. Go ahead and introduce yourself and begin, sir. Uh, Chair Cornish, uh, committee members, my name is Paul Schnell. I am the Chief of Police for the City of Maplewood, testifying today on behalf of the Minnesota Chiefs of Police <laughs> Association. We are grateful uh, for the opportunity to provide some brief testimony today. The Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association is not in support of House File 188 for the following reasons. We believe Minnesota's current permit to uh, law carry, uh, provides reasonable and constitutionally sound public safety protections. As you know, under Minnesota law, permit holders are required to complete basic pistol safety training from a inst certified instructor before they are issued a permit to carry. That training includes, among other things, instructions in the fundamentals of pistol use, successful completion of an actual shooting qualification exercise, and instruction in fundamental legal aspects of possession, carry, and use, including self-defense and the restrictions in the use of deadly force. House File 188 eliminates uh, the safety training requirement for those who just choose to constitutionally carry. Um, allowing even people who've never handled a gun to carry one in public, which we feel represents uh, a significant community safety concern. Under, Minnesota, uh, under Minnesota's current law, police chiefs and sheriffs serve as a simple but critical public safety vetting mechanism for those wishing to lawfully purchase or carry a handgun. House File 188 allows a permitless carry and removes the reasonable expectation that, uh, that thousands of law-abiding Minnesota gun owners have done since the law's current 2003 passage, which, uh, which helps keep firearms from those who are prohibited. Uh, Chair Cornish, uh, members of the Public Safety uh, Committee, we urge you not to support uh, this move, measure moving forward, and uh, we thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. <coughs> Plotts. 
Good morning. And begin morning. your. Good. Oh, he does. Good. Go ahead and begin your two minutes. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Cornish, Cornish and members of the, the committee. Uh, my name is John Pletz. I live in St. Paul, and I'm a member of the 40% Club, uh, which I will explain in a moment. I want to let you know that I don't have a problem with properly and reasonably regulated uh, firearms. Uh, over the years, I've gone goose and duck hunting and skeet shooting. However, the bill before you today, HF 188, is neither a proper, sensible, or reasonable regulation of firearms. You may ask, how did I become a member of the 40% Club? On April 16th, 2014, I was driving our family car with my 20-year-old daughter, Michelle, our eight-month-old grandson, TJ, and my daughter's estranged boyfriend, Tim, in the back seat. We were driving Tim home after a dinner meeting. Halfway to Tim's house, Tim pulled out a concealed handgun and shot her point blank in the head, killing her. What exactly is the 40% Club? Well, according to recent statistics in The Trace, a nonprofit organization, 40% of Americans know someone who was fatally shot or committed suicide with a gun. I'm asking each member of this committee today to think about what I'm saying. I'm not going to mince words. Right now, the bill before you is just words on paper. You, the committee members, have no personal or emotional investment in it. However, if you decide to support the, this bill, and it does pass, then I hope that you, a family member or a friend, will be able to firsthand experience what it's like to be a member of the 40% Club, directly as a result of the new law created by this bill. It's simple, watering down of existing sensible, proper, and reasonable gun laws and regulations like this bill does, makes it more likely that someone you know will be injured or killed by a firearm. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We let you run over a little bit because the other guy finished early. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Reverend Rolf Olson is next, and then Bill Krause would follow him. Welcome, Reverend. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Go ahead and begin. Hello, representatives. Mr. Cornish, thank you for letting me address you this morning. My name is Rolf Olson. I'm a resident of Cottage Grove. I'm a pastor at Ridgefield Lutheran in South Minneapolis. I'm also a gun owner and a hunter. But I also come to you today as the father of Catherine Ann Olson. I'll put this up here. Catherine was a bright, lively, energetic young woman who at age 24 answered an ad for a Craigslist nanny and she went to Savage and a young 19-year-old man shot her in the back. His motivation, he just wanted to see what it felt like to kill somebody. Many of you read about it, it was on the front page of the Strib and of the Pioneer Press. So I've personally experienced the heart-rending grief of losing a loved one to senseless gun violence. And I'm passionate about sparing others that same pain. You can hear my pain right now. And I'm here to speak against the Nash Permitless Carry Bill. And I'm against it because we are a culture of standards. We have standards that people need to meet to graduate, to get a job, to drive a car. We have standards to get elected to the state legislature. We're a culture of standards. And this bill would eliminate almost all standards to get a deadly weapon in our state. It would eliminate the age limit of 21. It would eliminate the requirement to pass a criminal background check. It would eliminate the requirement to pass gun safety training, an excellent program that my son and I enjoyed a number of years ago. If this bill passes, people who couldn't pass a criminal background check and have never learned how to handle a gun safely would be able to carry one in public. How would that protect public safety? But even more, this bill defines those places where guns could not be banned. These places would include schools, churches, and other places of worship, hospitals, colleges, even the state fairgrounds. Ironically, it exempts gun shows, gun shops, gun ranges. And so according to the logic of this sir, bill... your two minutes are up. Sorry. I encourage you to vote against this bill. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, bill Kraus followed by uh, Cindy Olson, if you want to be ready to go. Good morning. 
Morning. Hello, I'm Bill Cross from Plymouth, Minnesota. I've been a gun owner for close to 40 years. HF-188 Nash Permitless Carry is an extreme, irresponsible, and an insult to proud history of responsible gun ownership consistent with Minnesota sportsman tradition. I don't have a problem with responsible people owning guns, but we can't ignore the U can't ignore that the U.S. has a gun death rate that is 25 times higher than that of other developed nations. We seem to want to ignore the deadly problem that we have here in the United States. Owning a gun requires taking responsibility for that gun. I remember when you needed to have a very good reason to be able to carry a gun in public. Under current law, you have to have, apply for a permit, get a background check, take a class and pass a simple test to carry a gun. To take away the background checks and the training required to get a permit is the height of irresponsibility with a firearm. This permitless bill and other bills being pushed by the gun lobby make irresponsibility with a gun legal. HF 188 would let anyone carry a gun in any public place as defined by this bill, including churches, schools, and hospitals. As I see it's written, this is a threat to public health and safety. We should be working on funding peer-reviewed research on the American gun violence <coughs> epidemic and preventing gun violence with common sense gun safety legislation. As a Minnesota resident and gun owner, I ask the committee to vote no on HF 188, Permalist Carry. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, next is uh, Cindy Olson from Madison Lake. Cindy? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. I represent nobody, me. That's who, just me. And maybe I speak for a lot of people in the state of Minnesota. Um, public policy is meant to better the lives of the public at large, to attempt to redress harms and create better systems for all of us. But in this case, peer-reviewed research indicates compellingly that both of the proposed policies we're going to talk about today create significant threats to the safety of the general public, which it is your charge to preserve and protect. Uh, Nancy's already covered the fact that it's easy to get a, a gun permit in the state of Minnesota. 71,000 were um, uh, released last year. Um, it's sort of like getting a driver's license. You know, you take some training, you take a test, you renew every few years. <coughs> hey, maybe we don't need driver's licenses. Hmm, there's a thought. Um, so research shows that long-standing protocols for the prudent use of checks and balances are effective in minimizing gun-related deaths, homicides, suicides, accidents. And yesterday I sent all of you homework on some of the, the uh, research that I looked at from the Center for Disease Control and the um, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association. Pretty good stuff. Minnesota ranks seventh in the country for states with the most gun restrictions and the fewest gun-related deaths. And research shows that Conversely, when you relax your gun laws, you're going to have higher uh, fatalities. So those low gun re related fatalities include things like required permits, background checks, no stand your ground legislation, difficult access to guns. All of that keeps us in this relatively safe position. Um, I don't own a gun. I never have and I never will. But I do know many responsible gun owners who see the wisdom in having permits. Uh, my husband, a decorated Vietnam veteran, first cab, military intel, does not support these bills. My two grown sons who hunt, one of them has a permit to carry, they do not support these bills. Um, and the friend of one of my sons, who's a wounded and decorated Army Ranger, currently in service with multiple deployments, um, does not up. support these bills. Thank Please you vote no. Thanks for coming. Um, next up is. <laughs> Tim Nelson, followed by uh, Dennis Flurry, Executive Director for the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers. <coughs> Mr. Nelson. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good, Good morning, Chairman Cornish and morning. Uh, representatives. My name is Tim Nelson. I'm a 20 year retired Air Force veteran, having flown B 52s for 10 years active duty, including the Gulf War and the C 5s in the reserves. I'm a lifelong hunter an NRA member, a conceal and carry permit holder. And I'm the person who called the FBI and Zacharias Musawi when he tried to get training in 2001. And the FBI credits my call for them apprehending him 27 days before 9-11. I believe in doing the right thing no matter the personal cost. I believe in the Second Amendment rights 
And I believe there is a great responsibility that goes with those Second Amendment rights. In the military, I was required to qualify every year with my sidearm, every year. And I had to be proficient, competent with my weapon, and to know what the rules of engagement were. As a law-abiding citizen, I support my permit, and I believe it's a responsible gun owner. Having to renew it every five years isn't a burden to me. It's the right thing to do as a part of the community member. Permitless carry undermines these very systems that promotes responsible and safe gun ownership. I have an obligation to, we all have an obligation to conduct ourselves in a law-abiding manner, especially when handling or having access to firearms. But sometimes individuals face mental health issues that do not allow them to think rationally. And that's where we need family, <coughs> law enforcement, and the courts to develop a systematic way to get these people help. I was dating Barbara Larson when she was murdered by her husband December 23rd of last year. Her ex-husband was a retired Faribault police captain, somebody I would think we could trust with a firearm after he retired. He shot her in the head at the Chamber of Commerce five times before taking his own life. His two children, his grandchildren, and I are all devastated by this senseless act. Barb was the 17th person murdered in Minnesota to lose her life to domestic violence in 2016. It was a second murder-suicide in Faribault in a two-week period. We need to have common sense gun laws that protect and preserve the rights of law-abiding gun owners. Sir, your time is up. Thank you. I want to let you finish your story, though, so I'll let you run a hair over. I didn't want to cut you off in the middle of that story. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Um, Mr. Flirty, uh, Dennis Flirty, the executive director of the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. Welcome, Mr. Flirty, followed by uh, Jeff Ed Blad and then Jim Backstrom, and that'll be the end of our public testimony when these three are done. Mr. Flirty. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dennis Flaherty and I'm Executive Director of the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers <coughs> Association and I represent about 8,500 uh, rank and file uh, officers throughout the state. I uh, want to be here this morning to uh, go on record in opposition to this legislation and state that we do feel that this, uh, that the legislature does in fact have the right to um, regulate firearms, and we do believe that there's really no nexus between or any kind of guarantee in the Constitution as it relates to people's ability to carry uh, loaded firearms. We think that uh, the legislature has um, struck a, a fairly good balance with our current law uh, dealing with pistol permitting and, um, it, you know, by the fact that it requires backgrounds um, and uh, requiring applicants to, to um, complete training um, in gun safety and, um, and, um, and show that they're proficient in the use of a firearm before a permit is issued. We, we think that uh, serves the state well. And we absolutely oppose the repeal of our current permitting statutes, the backgrounding requirements, of people that are going to be carrying handguns and the training requirements. So um, just simply to be brief, um, we we do oppose uh, this effort. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Director Flaherty. Now we have uh, Jeff Edblad, a Santa County attorney and president of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, followed by Jim Backstrom, Dakota County attorney. Go ahead, sir. Chairman Cornish, members of the committee, good morning. My name is Jeff Edblad. I am the president of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association and I'm currently serving in my sixth term as the elected Isanti County Attorney. And I'd like to thank you this morning for providing the opportunity for the Minnesota County Attorneys Association to publicly join our partners in the Minnesota Law Enforcement Coalition community to publicly oppose House File 188 and I would urge you to not pass this legislation. Thank you. Mr. Backstrom will be waiving his testimony, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Backstrom. <coughs> it helped us shorten up our uh, program here a little bit. Um, now we have member questions, and if we could just try to ask a question, and I will abide by it myself, and uh, not give uh, long editorials, or go ahead, uh, Representative Dean, and then, well, Representative Constantine, Representative Becker-Finn, 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the testifiers who came down and spoke. Uh, your voice here at the Capitol is critical. I, you know, I could go down many rabbit holes and talk about a lot of issues around the Second Amendment, what it allows, what it doesn't allow, and restrictions. But I, I really think I'm coming down to one question, and that question is for the bill author. What problem is this bill trying to solve? Uh, Mr. N or Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Dean. You know, I, uh, it's a good question. I, my, my opinion is, if you remember the, uh, the Supreme Court ruling of, uh, that upheld the individual Second Amendment right uh, that we are able to keep and bear arms, and I, you know, I think it's a, it's a constitutional argument that we should be able to have. Um, you know, and I think that we've heard testimony that says that, uh, you know, the, the purchase of a permit and so on for law-abiding citizens and people who are permitted, and this bill does address those who are not permitted, uh, is a constitutional right. And you know that is the reason that I'm, I'm bringing this bill forward. I want to have the conversation, uh, and because I do think that a law-abiding gun owner has the ability, as we do in many other states, as you've heard, uh, should have that should have that right, and uh, that the uh, that that is their right to do so. And I'm I'm supportive of it. A follow-up? Yeah, a couple of follow-ups. Um, so, so you have mentioned that you know individuals who are prohibitive currently from carrying a firearm will still be prohibited from carrying a firearm, although now we have no system that's gonna verify who those individuals are because they'll have access uh, currently to, uh, well, they have access currently through gun shows, but they'll now have like no requirements. Um, and you know, it was brought up the issue of, of, of mental health and I think that one of the things that, that our law that we currently have in place uh, oftentimes will allow an individual to get past that point of crisis of mental health, which they may not be able to um, be thinking in their right mind and possibly not, um, not end up committing suicide. So, I mean, I don't think your answer was really good about what problem is this trying to solve. And I, you know, I understand people's passion about wanting to be able to carry firearms. And this is my personal point of view. I choose not to live my life with that kind of fear that I am threatened every moment of the day that I need to carry a gun to protect myself. Because if that's the way you think and if that's the way you function in your life, you don't know what freedom is. Okay, uh, Representative Constantine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Bill Tillman, Wyatt Earp, Wild Bill Hickok, Seth Bullock, Bat Masterson, heroes from our American West, town tamers. First thing each one of them did was draw a line in the sand and say, you can't bring a gun in uh, past this line. What would you say to them? Um, Representative Nash. Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Considine, against uh, again, as I had referenced in the Heller decision, that the, su the Supreme Court says that the Second Amendment is a guaranteed right to, to own a firearm and keep and bear arms. And, and I'm just merely trying to codify that in here. And uh, so that's, that's all I'm trying to do. And, you know, other than them having great TV shows from uh, our Wild West days, you know, I, I really, I can't say because I don't know what their intent was. And, you know, that's, that's my, my perspective. And as Representative Dean just said, you know, uh, he has his, his feelings on this. I have mine. Uh, and that's why we have hearings like this. That's why we have bills that come forward because uh, we want to talk about uh, what's important to us and to our constituents. And that's why we're here to have this conversation. Representative Constable, any follow-up? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Lucero. Or excuse me, uh, Becker Finn, Representative Becker Finn, and then Representative Lucero. Uh, <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and my, my question for Representative Nash is, uh, how important do you think it is to prevent domestic violence? Uh, Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and Representative Becker Finn. You know, I, I do believe that preventing domestic violence is important. Um, and I'm sure you're going to draw a corollary here, and I'm, 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 I'll just wait for that. But I do believe that it, that preventing domestic violence is important, and uh, you know I think that um, again, I, 
I'll just I'll wait for your next line of questioning. Representative Becker, uh, because we we hear a lot in this committee about how much everybody cares about preventing domestic violence, and we hear a lot in this committee, both sides, about how much we support law enforcement. And the fact is, is that when we have more guns, there's a better chance that a gun is going to be present in a domestic violence situation. And the presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation makes it five times more likely, at least five times more likely, that that woman is going to end up killed. And so I just want to make sure that we're all clear that when we say that we care about preventing domestic violence and domestic violence homicide, that there's a direct relation with access to guns and how that affects domestic violence homicides in our communities. Okay, Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have uh, one of the packets that was passed out and it's titled, Examples of Permit to Carry Denials in District 30B, Representative Eric Lucero. So when I page through this thing, there are 61 pages that I counted, uh, an average of approximately 15 per page. So that totals 915 in this stack that I have here. Well, District 30B includes the city of Hanover, which straddles Wright County and Hennepin County lines. Uh, the total population is 3,200. On the Hennepin County side, I actually text the mayor of Hanover, there's only 800 people that live on the Hennepin County side of Hanover. So 915 names out of 800, obviously the data doesn't make sense. And so as we, as I uh, have often said, if you torture the data long enough, it'll confess to anything. In this case, this is not a torturing of the data, I think this is just flat out made up because it doesn't make sense. You can't have 915 names out of a population of 800. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Representative Pinto, followed by Hills. Remember, we've just got a few minutes left for member questions. If we have too many, we'll cut into the opposition's testimony next time, so. Okay, um, thank, uh, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As, as alluded to before, I feel like there's so many different possible lines here um, to uh, to go through. What I want to ask about is the uh, the assertion that this wouldn't prohibit anyone, wouldn't permit someone to have a gun who's not currently permitted to do so. It doesn't change those requirements. And I guess what I'm struggling with on that is it seems like when I when I look at the the kinds of um, uh, considerations that, that are taken into account when somebody gets a permit, it seems like this would allow somebody who is, first of all, um, teenagers, 18 to 21, um, people who are not trained, we've talked about that, people who are uh, listed in the criminal gang investigative data system right now can't get a permit, but they this will allow them to get a gun. Um, and uh, citizen, somebody who's not a citizen or a permanent resident of the United States, a lot, they could have a gun. Um, there's n no uh, nothing there. And then most significantly is um, people who have been determined to be um, and considered to be da a danger to themselves and to uh, to others. Uh, right now, that's a grounds, and, and I understand Re Representative Lucero's point, but when I look at any one of these individual lines, uh, I see some people who seem like it'd be pretty scary for themselves and the rest of us for them to have a gun, and this would allow them to do so. So I'm wondering about the response to that line of questioning. Sure. Um, and Representative Nash. Mr. Chair and Representative Pinto, thank you for the question. Um, and, and I've asked Professor Joe Olson, who helped us draft this, um, because I, I, I don't think that uh, what you've asserted is necessarily true. And I want to make sure, that, as we said in the intro, that people who are prohibited are not permitted in this bill. Uh, and I'd, I'd like him to go line by line, because as you've heard me joke in other committees, I'm neither a lawyer and don't play one on television, so I don't want to presume to offer legal advice. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to the lawyer. Um, Mr. Ham uh, Olson, can you do it in a minute? We haven't got time for back and forth a lot here. Yes, I can do it in a minute. Uh, my name is Joseph Olson. I'm a professor of law at uh, Mitchell Hamlin Law School. I'm obviously not here on their behalf. I'm here as president of the Gun Owners Civil Rights Alliance. Um, when the Kerry bill was drafted in 2003, uh, the, an attempt was made to list all of the kinds of people who were already prohibited from possession of firearms. <coughs> so if you can't lawfully possess a firearm, you certainly can't carry one. Uh, and uh, the intention is uh, under Representative Nash's bill is if you can't possess one legally, you can't carry one. Uh, there were uh, legislation two years ago, I believe, maybe three, uh, dealing with domestic violence situations, and we supported that legislation. And those people are prohibited in certain circumstances. So this is not intended to change the existing law with respect to who is prohibited from possessing 
And if you can't possess, obviously you can't carry. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Pinto. No, just, just briefly, so I, I understand those assertions, Professor, but I guess I, as I look at this further, I just don't see where in the law someone who poses, a, who has a substantial likelihood of being a danger to themselves or the public is otherwise prohibited, where someone who is uh, on the criminal gang investigative data, data system is otherwise prohibited, um, and where uh, someone who is not trained in the safe use of a pistol is otherwise prohibited. Did you, was that a question? No. It seems like with the timing it probably isn't, but I'd be happy to engage with him and, and the other time. I'd be happy to have it be a question, but I'm guessing probably there isn't time for that. Why don't we do that. it offline and go to Representative Hillstrom? Okay. That would be the last question. We're already overdue on our member questions. Go ahead, Representative Th Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is for uh, Representative Nash. So, Representative Nash, in your amendment, um, you put back in the pieces about um, when you have to tell law enforcement um, that you have... Uh, a permit or when you are carrying. Um, and I actually think that we need to have some discussion about how this would actually work because I'm not sure it actually would work. <laughs> so under current law, if you are stopped, for example, in your motor vehicle um, and you have a permit, if law enforcement asks you if you have a permit, you have to display. You have to tell them. And if they ask you, you have to tell them that you're in possession of a gun. So if law enforcement stops someone and there's a gun present in the, in the vehicle, law enforcement would almost have to do an instant background check on the person that they stopped immediately to find out if they can legitimately have that firearm or not from my reading of the language of the proposal. So is that your intention, that any time law enforcement sees a firearm in a vehicle, that they would have to do a full and complete immediate background check of anyone prior to letting them leave the scene? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Hillstrom. Uh, again, I'm gonna let the the lawyer who drafted this uh, go through the, the, the legal nuances of that. Unless I'm wrong, uh, Representative Hillstrom, right now, when you get stopped with a shotgun or a rifle, uh, you don't have to have a permit for that. I would, and we don't even have to have a case on those guns due to a recent uh, law that we passed. So I, I would imagine if you see a gun, you, like a lot of armed people walked into here today, a few of them with a gun showing, and nobody asked them if they had a permit. You'd probably to treat them the same way as you would then. But Representative, or uh, Mr. Olson, go ahead. Uh, I think the situation is is the same as it currently is. If uh, if uh, you see a firearm, the officer can inquire about it, uh, which is exactly what they do today. Mr. Chair, just to follow up then, and, and yeah. maybe I can get some additional information offline as well. But right now, if law enforcement asks you if you can legally possess that firearm, you would have a permit to show either a permit to carry or a permit to purchase to show that you can legally be in possession of it. If you go to a permit list, there is nothing to show. So other than doing a full and complete background check with that person, there is no way for that law enforcement officer to know whether or not that firearm is possessed legally. I believe from my reading. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative, I, I don't know enough about the information that's available on the computers in the patrol cars to know whether it's available, wh how long it would take to get it. Uh, it's, I, I, you know, I simply can't answer that question. I mean, there, there are lots of times when a police officer comes up to a car and observes things in the car that don't appear to be to be 100% uh, uh, on the up and up that they have to investigate. And I think this would simply be one of those cases. Uh, I understand uh, there's a nice one pager out from the Department of Public Safety uh, about how all, this, how all this wonderful information is available at one click on the computer. And, and Mr. Chair and Representative Hillstrom, I'm happy to talk with you offline to make sure that we clarify that so we can get on the same page. I, th I think when I'm hunting in Arizona, I leave the handgun laying right on the street. I've been stopped by cops before or uh, talking to them. They don't even look at it second time. I mean, I think after we lose our fear of guns, we get to realize just because there's a gun there doesn't mean you have to have the fear or run a check unless you have some reason to believe that they're a prohibited person. But uh, That ends the um, member questions. And now we're going to uh, Representative um, Nash. Do you want like a minute to close? That we got to go here, and then I'll lay your bill over. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the in the uh, 
spirit of brevity, I appreciate the spirited conversation. Uh, we have had conversations offline. I do appreciate that very much. Uh, you know, this is something that is very important to Minnesotans, uh, both sides, and we want to make sure that we hear both. But uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your time and uh, ready to move on. Okay, with that, we'll lay over Bill House File 188 uh, for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. And uh, I'd like to thank the uh, crowd here for maintaining composure on both sides. It's been very orderly. Now we'll bring up uh, House File 238, Representative Nash. Oh, and in this one, I think the, with the instructions I read, we were going to have uh, 20 minutes to present and then start with the public testimony. Okay. Oh, Representative Nash, this one has an amendment at all. You would like me to move that amendment? Mr. Chair, if you would, be so kind to put that in the shape that I desire. Okay, the Chair will move House File 238 for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill and also move the A17-0167 amendment, which should be under your packet. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, to your amended bill, Representative Nash. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm going to give this kind of a high-level overview again, and then we'll bring up testifiers. Uh, this is House File 238, which is uh, also going to be known as the Defense of Dwelling and Person Act. It modifies Minnesota's self-defense laws in order to uh, codify years of case law into statutory language, making it easier for law-abiding Minnesotans to understand self-defense law. Here's what the bill does, a number of things. First, it puts decades of case law into clear statutory language. Today, to understand when it is legal to defend yourself at home or in public, one must understand a core set of Minnesota statutes. Then must, one must understand and commit to memory nearly a dozen Minnesota Supreme Court and Court of Appeals cases. In fact, you need to understand Minnesota court cases all the way back to 1865 in order to understand what you are able or required to do. In a self-defense situation, law-abiding citizen literally must process all of this information in an incredibly brief period of time, almost instantaneously. Second, it removes the duty to retreat requirement from Minnesota law. The idea of duty to retreat is not part of statutory law in Minnesota. It was the result of court cases and exists, like most of our self-defense law, only in case law. A law-abiding citizen not engaged in criminal behavior in a public place should not be forced, should not be forced to retreat prior to being able to defend themselves. Finally, this bill explains the definition of one's place of abode or home to include other locations that an individual may be residing in temporarily. There's been a lot of misinformation floating around there about gun control groups and others about what this bill does and doesn't do, so I want to be very, very clear once again. Under this bill, a person must be in imminent fear of death or great bodily harm, and the force used must be reasonable as defined in statute. A person must be reluctant participant, meaning that they could, have been, that they could not have been provoked or initiated the situation. I'm also aware that our friends in law enforcement are here to testify against this bill just as they did in 2011, citing concerns with officer safety. Under this bill, under no circumstances, if you know the person is a police officer, is an individual allowed to use deadly force against them when they are acting lawfully? 33 other states have similar laws, the support for which has been bipartisan. In fact, in 2004, Barack Obama, then an Illinois senator, co-sponsored and voted for legislation that expanded Illinois' Stand Your Ground law. As I asked with House File 188 earlier, you're going to hear a lot of information doing, during this testimony. I'd encourage you to take a hard look at the data from Dr. Lott, who will be coming forward here in just a second. He has spent a lifetime studying laws like this, and then to make your decisions accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you want who's? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Olson, who's come down again, Professor Joe Olson. He'll be our first testifier. Okay, uh, and uh, we have had the timer on for your 20 minutes, so I'll begin, Mr. Olson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, currently, in order to understand our self defense law, you have to navigate statutory and case law, some of which are in conflict. Uh, this bill is intended to make to clarify uh, some of those those issues. Uh, it doesn't lower the threshold for self-defense. Clarifies and defines it uh, more carefully. 
The test currently for self-defense is that you have to reasonably believe uh, that you are in danger of serious injury uh, or you have to be in uh, your place of abode. Uh, what this statute does is carry that same language over. Uh, it's crossed out in uh, at the beginning. It comes back in in subdivision two where it says repeatedly <clears throat> you can resist or commit prevent the commission of a felony which the individual reasonably believes is a felony in his individual dwelling. That's current law. You can resist or prevent an act which the individual reasonably believes is an offense or attempted offense that in imminently, that's added actually, that's part of the case law but it's now put in the statute, exposes the individual or another person to substantial bodily harms, great bodily harm or death, or third, to resist or prevent an act which the individual reasonably believes, once again, is the commission or imminent commission of a forcible felony. Uh, the forcible felony language and definition uh, is new. What it does is it takes those felonies which have as elements of the offense death, threatened death or injury to the individual and puts them in a list. So our person on the street doesn't have to say what are the elements of that offense and is it the kind of offense that could cause me to reasonably fear death or serious injury. Ah, it's an element of the offense. So yes, I can defend against that. Uh, it makes that clear for our citizens. Uh, subdivision three um, essentially codifies uh, current law and practice. <coughs> this is exactly what police officers are trained to do when their lives are in danger. The same. Uh, ability, flexibility should be available to individuals. Um, and the presumptions are just that. Uh, they are rebuttable. They are not irrebuttable. Uh, and they assist the individual who's faced with a life-threatening situation uh, to act appropriately to defend themselves. Uh, without having to have a law degree, without having to have a lawyer in their pocket. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Olson. And next, Dr. John Lott, President of the Crime Prevention Research Center. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome, sir, and begin if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, my name is John Lott. I'm president of the Crime Prevention Research Center. I wanted to thank uh, Chairman Cormish, uh, Cornish, uh, Ranking Man Member Hillstrom, uh, Representative Nash, who invited me, and distinguished members of the committee for the opportunity to discuss standard ground laws. These laws basically help the most vulnerable people in our society to be able to defend themselves, the people who use them the most are the people most likely to be victims of violent crime that overwhelmingly tends to be poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas. There are 33 states that have uh, stand your ground type rules. Uh, most of them are through legislation, though six of them have been through court decisions. Uh, and in fact, you have some places in the United States that have stand your ground rules for over 150 years. The support up until the last few years has been overwhelmingly bipartisan. You can find a number of states, in fact, 12 states, where at least one of the bodies of the legislature have passed these rules unanimously. The last few years, though, uh, these, there's been more of a debate on this, and they've largely stemmed from incidents in Florida involving Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis. The irony is that uh, in the Trayvon Martin case, the stand your ground rules were not relevant. Uh, you know, the notion that somebody should retreat as far as possible. As uh, was just mentioned earlier, uh, if a person initiates the fight that occurs, they can't then go and claim stand your ground type protections. So you have two possible interpretations in the Trayvon Martin case. Either um, uh, Trayvon Martin had uh, George Zimmerman pinned to the ground and there was no place for him to retreat 
or the other alternative is somehow uh, uh, George Zimmerman initiated the attack. In that case, you also wouldn't have been able to use stand your ground as a defense. In the Jordan Davis case, somebody tried to use stand your ground, but in fact, he was still convicted of uh, firing the gun. And the theater shooting that people have talked about is in court right now, but we could talk about that. So I'm not gonna go and talk about the, the main points of the law other than what I mentioned with initiation. But claims of racism with regard to stand your ground basically have it backwards. Again, the groups that are disproportionately victims of violent crime are the ones most likely to rely on stand your ground. Florida has the most detailed data on this. Blacks make about 16.7% of the Florida population, but they account for 34% of the state's defendants invoking stand your ground rules. Black defendants who invoke the statute are also more likely to be acquitted than whites by about four percentage points. Uh, the data that's been collected goes from 2006, January 2006, when the Stand Your Ground law went into effect through the end of 2014. There are 119 cases. The claim of racism using this often looks at the fact that 67% of those who killed a black person face no penalty, compared to 57% of those who killed a white person. The problem that this ignores is that murders almost always involve people of the same race. 80% of the people who killed blacks involving stand your ground cases were themselves black. About 80% of those who killed whites uh, were white. And when you take that into account, uh, you realize that if you wanna go and declare racism based on who's most likely to uh, be acquitted, who kills a black, you have to realize it's primarily blacks who are using that defense in having killed a black in self-defense. And so you get 64% of blacks who raised stand your ground defense were not convicted compared to 60% of whites. Uh, the cases are not similar in other ways also. Uh, blacks killed in confrontations uh, involving stand your ground cases were 26% more likely to be armed than whites. By a 25 percentage point margin, the blacks killed were also more likely to be involved in the process of committing a crime. And they were also slightly more likely to have witnesses present uh, when the attack occurred. And when you run statistical tests that account for all these different factors at the same time, what you essentially find is that white defendants are more likely in stand your ground cases to be convicted. People invoking stand your ground laws who kill blacks were also more likely to be convicted than uh, people who killed whites. And as one would hope, whether someone, uh, whether the person killed initiated the confrontation and whether there was an eyewitness were by far the most important factors for determining whether or not there was a conviction. I just briefly mentioned something, uh, uh, well, I guess I'll just go on to other research. Um, there's a number of studies that have been done linking uh, stand your ground laws to murder or homicide rates. There are about equal numbers of studies on both sides. Uh, slightly more find a benefit than find a bad effect. But <clears throat> there are a couple things to point out here. The ones that find the benefit all look at national data, basically look at it for all the years that the data is available. The ones that find that there's been a bad effect either look at just one state, in the case of the Journal of the American Medical Association, and for a limited number of years, starting in, uh, in 1999, or uh, they look at only a very narrow period of time, and I'll get into that. In the research that I published uh, in the University of Chicago Press and other papers by Carl Moody and others, uh, in my case, I look at data from 1977 through 2012. Uh, what I find is that after you have stand your ground rules go into effect, uh, murder rates fall on average by about 1.5 percentage points per year annually during the first 10 years that those laws are in effect. The JAMA study, which was alluded to earlier in the public comments on the previous bill, um, finds that there is an increase in homicides from about 5.9 per 100,000 to about 6.3 per 100,000 
before and after the law goes into effect. That's about a 6.9% increase. But the thing is, they only look at one state and they don't control for any other factors. So for example, one factor that one may want to take into account is that between 2005 and 2006, there was a huge drop in arrests for murder in Florida. The arrest rate for murders in Florida fell from 82.4% in 2005 to 66.9% in 2006. So while you had a 6.9% increase in homicides, at the same time you had a 19% drop in the arrest rate for murders. And also one should point out uh, that this study is looking at homicides rather than murders. And I'm not sure most people understand that there's a distinction between homicides and murders. Uh, hom the big difference is whether or not you have justifiable homicides involved, whether it be by police or be by civilians. And uh, I think it's a mistake then to go and look at uh, homicides rather than murders when you're looking at this because you have to ask yourself, if there are more justifiable homicides that occurred, and that's partly what's driving the distant difference between looking at homicides and murders, if somebody's protecting themselves from a crime or a police officer is being threatened, I'm not sure that that's bad in the same way that a drop in murders would be significant. The other study was by uh, Texas A&M. Uh, they only looked at laws adopted between 2005 and 2010. They ignored states that had these rules imposed by court action. Dr. Only Lund, uh, you could so keep going, but I just want to let you know that we've got about uh, five minutes and two people behind you to okay. go into that. I'm slide. sorry. That's okay. uh, I can, anyway, um, you know, the important thing is they didn't look at anything after 2010. Again, you have this difference between homicides and murders. And, you know, again, uh, there's questions about not being controlled. So why somebody would throw out all the data and all the laws prior to 2005 uh, isn't really obvious. My general rule is that if somebody throws out data, they better have a good reason for throwing it out. And so you have, in any case, the data is divided on this question. But I, I appreciate your time and... Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor, for coming all the way out. Um, we have about um, three and a half minutes for the next two folks if they want to come up together. Or Brian Strauser of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe that uh, Mr. Strauser is going to cede his time to Mr. Rausch. Okay. Um, Mr. Rausch from the NRA. <coughs> give you about a uh, little over two minutes. Go ahead. Again, good morning. Uh, I'll make this quick. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for taking public comment on uh, House File 238. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the bill author, Representative Jim Nash, for having the courage and strength in his principles to introduce this legislation. Taking out a tax from both sides is never easy, but I'm, I'm proud to say the NRA and our members stand with Representative Nash in his efforts. 27 states have legislatively enacted stand your ground laws, and in each case, NRA has been there to support each measure. We do, do, we do so again here in Minnesota because it is a fundamental right for an individual to defend his or her life, family, property, and the well-being of others no matter where that person has a lawful right to be. Once again, it comes down to the rights of an individual, and we'll support that every single time. Uh, yesterday I heard all the arguments opposed to Sandy Ground as I was in Des Moines, Iowa, where their, where their uh, legislature is looking to enact a similar law. Opponents make claims and even accuse supporters of hiding behind the Second Amendment. Uh, that attack is incredibly false. Supporters of Sandy Ground do not hide behind the Second Amendment. We stand firmly in front of it and defend it with legislation such as this. Again, I thank the committee for the hearing. Uh, for hearing testimony, and I look forward to the public comments and respectful debate continuing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Fred from Burnsville again. Are you here? If you folks could get ready to come down, and then we're followed by Tim Spreck, who would be next from the Minnesota Weapons Collectors. Go ahead, sir, your two minutes. Um, I heard a comment that we're not a safe country. I'll direct everybody to take a look at the World Health Organization, who murder rates for the world. 
starts at 98 and it goes down to 2.2. We're at 4.2. We're at the bottom of the list. We're one of the safest countries in the world and we have the most guns. Most of the countries that have uh, higher rates than us are already disarmed. So I, I think that's a great, um, great piece of information to use and so forth. Um, also wanted to uh, mention a few things that society is dangerous and we can't legislate perfection. And I talked about some of the uh, the murder rates and how they've gone down and, and the homicide rates and that the good guy shootings are in there. But we also have to remember too there's 4,000 deaths by feet and knives and clubs. There's 11,000 DWI deaths per year. There's 38,000 auto deaths per year. There's 10,000 kids under the age of 14 get killed on bicycles every year. There's 3,600, uh, 3, over 3,600 drowning deaths, 10 per day in the United States every year. 48,000, I'm sorry, 480,000, almost half a million from smoking in the United States. And 12,000 people per year in the United States fall, just, just die from falling down. So we have to remember that in the states that have done uh, castle doctrines and things like that, their significant crime dropped 60, 70, 80 percent in just a few years. And I think one of the ways that I explain people is right now in Minnesota, you're required by law to flee your home if somebody breaks in. It's 25 below, you got bare feet, sleeping where, you got about 30 seconds to get the dog, the kids, the wife, and get out the back window. And then you're going to be out there for about a minute and you're going to realize that you just left your home. What do you do now? In two in the morning, is your neighbor going to let you in? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Tim Spreck followed by uh, Mr. Joseph from Protect Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Spreck, go ahead and introduce yourself and begin your two minutes. Mr. Chair and members, Tim Spreck today speaking for the interest of the Minnesota Weapons Collectors. Uh, the Minnesota Weapons Collectors is a pretty large organization that holds a number of gun shows throughout the year. This gives them the unique opportunity to really take the temperature of what the folks out there in, in Minnesota and the neighboring states are thinking with regard to, to gun ownership and gun rights and, and, and related issues. And on this issue, the board has instructed me today to make sure that you folks all know that they support this law. The, the way that it codifies case law and, and actually gives the rights back to the human beings that are in their homes trying to protect themselves and their properties. <coughs> and with that, I'll step aside, uh, urge you to move this bill through. It's a good piece of legislation. We'd like to see it enacted. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Spur. Um, Rachel Joseph, I'm sorry, I said Mr. Joseph. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead and introduce yourself and begin your um, testimony. My name is Rachel Joseph. I'm the Director of Outreach at Protect Minnesota and I work with survivors of gun violence. I'm also a gun violence survivor. My aunt Shelley Joseph Cordell was shot and killed at the Hennepin County Government Center <coughs> Courthouse on September 29th, 2003. During the trial, I learned that the woman who murdered her bought her gun through a private sale at a Minnesota gun show for $60, no background check. Having Shelley taken from our family is a loss we will never recover from. In my work with others personally impacted by gun violence, I've seen the devastating toll gun violence has on families and I have very grave concerns about HF 238 Stand Your Ground in Minnesota. In November 2015, my friend Cameron Clark was one of five protesters shot near Minneapolis's fourth precinct. Alan Scarcella and three friends went to the protest wearing face masks and lured a group of black men up a side street where he fired at them with a handgun, hitting and injuring five, including Cameron. In court, Scarcella used the stand your ground defense, claiming it was a justifiable homicide because he felt threatened. Despite having sent a text to friends that read, the gun I'm getting is proven to kill black guys in a single shot. Scarcella's justifiable homicide defense would likely have exonerated him in a stand your ground state. HF 238 would change Minnesota's existing use of force law by removing the obligation to retreat from danger before using deadly force outside the home and giving the presumption of innocence to the shooter. HF 238 represents a particular threat to communities of color and immigrants. 
If it were to pass, almost any shooting could be justified, even if the threat was simply someone's skin color or religion. In 2015, the American Bar Association reported that the application of standard ground laws is unpredictable, uneven, and results in racial disparities. Okay, ma'am, your time is up. Sorry. Okay. On behalf of Thank myself, you. my aunt, and Cameron, I ask you all to vote no. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Chair, if I could just very quickly and not to... Uh, I, it's obviously a very sorry story and I feel badly for her, but I believe it's been proven that the Scarcella case was, he was, an, he was not an unwilling participant that they initiated that. So I just wanted to make sure that that was on record. Okay, Mr. Chief Snell. Mr. Chair? We'll give you a uh, 15, 20 seconds. Can we just get a clarification of what Representative Nash meant by that? Okay, go ahead. No, I, so what did you mean by that? So the, Mr. Chair and Representative Pinto, the, the stand your ground uh, thing that we're talking about says that uh, if you read the bill, that it, they have to be an unwilling participant in order to claim stand your ground. Uh, the Scarcella case was actually initiated by the, the folks who carried out the, the shooting. So. Okay, so you're saying, um, uh, Mr. Chair, I think you're saying then that the that stand your ground would not have been available is, is your assertion. And okay. Mr. Chair, thank, thank you. you. And that's, yes, and I should have been a little more elaborative. I was trying to be brief, but yes, the, that's what I was saying. Make sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, welcome back. Chief Paul Snell, followed by a Ross Kuhn <coughs> from West St. Paul. Thank Chief you. Snell. Chair Cornish, committee members, Paul Schnell again, on behalf of the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association. Um, the Chiefs of Police Association is not in support of House File 238 um, for a couple basic reasons. First and foremost, we believe that Minnesota has a current law that adequately protects reasonable and law-abiding people who act in self-defense. We offer two relatively recent examples that demonstrate the relevancy of the current law. <clears throat> In May of 2015, a 20-year-old patron of a Maplewood nightclub was shot and killed when the patron and four associates went after uh, an armed permit holder security guard. After that case was fully investigated, it was reviewed by the county <coughs> attorney's office, resulting in no charges against the security guard who acted in self-defense. Second, on a summer evening in July of 2015, a man and woman were sitting on the bluff of the Mississippi River just four miles from this building where Summit <laughs> Avenue ends and meets Mississippi River Boulevard. As they were sitting in that location, four young men approached them with the intent to commit an armed robbery. When the armed suspect demanded that the couple turn over their belongings, the male a victim who was an authorized uh, carry permit holder was able to draw his weapon and fire on the armed suspect. Following the shooting, the permit holder called police and rendered aid to his attacker. The suspect died at the scene. Once again, a thorough investigation followed and the permit holder was not charged. Second, as you know, there has been considerable attention given to police use of force. Across our nation, there has been call for increased training in the use of de-escalation tactics by police. We believe that House File 238 is inconsistent with the increased and reasonable demand for de-escalation where appropriate. While we recognize that police officers are provided considerable levels of training in firearms use and tactics, we believe that House File 238 uh, changes, does not is inconsistent with the values of our communities who expect that we take reasonable steps to de-escalate and use force only when deadly force is reasonable. Okay, Chief. We urge you to uh, stand in opposition to this. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Okay, uh, Ross Kuhn, West St. Paul, followed by Heather. Did you want to make that uh, substitution again, or are you going to testify? Okay, first of all, Ross, followed by um, Ms. Martins. <coughs> Good morning. Go ahead, morning. Mr. Kuhn, you? with your... Good. Hi, my name is uh, Ross Kuhn. I'm here on behalf of myself and family members in West St. Paul, Zimmerman, and Elk River. Uh, Americans have a long, proud history of lethal self-defense, dating back through centuries of brave Americans defending what's theirs. Uh, early on, legal, lethal, lethal self-defense was a necessity when protecting our homesteads against marauding savages claiming to own the land that was rightfully ours. For decades, brave Americans needed to carry lethal arms to defend ourselves against the possibility of a lawless uprising of our valuable workforce. Had it not been for liberal use of force, we would not have been able to control our sea of laborers in the fields. As our country evolved, we had to adopt more tactics to maintain the integrity of our society and our government. 
It was not lightly that we took to weapons and rope to ensure the purity of our nation. Now, as we endure a murder rate that's the highest it's been in 47 years, as Mr. we face Chair, hordes of illegals and so-called refugees, this it is of the utmost is importance. Expensive. What? Why? It is What's happened? Excuse me? Uh, and maybe to you, but not to a lot of people in the room. We never Over. shut down any of the opposition. We're certainly not going to shut down the people. Marauding savages and talking about lynching <laughs> black people. As we face hordes of illegals and so-called refugees, it is of the utmost importance that we be granted broad liberties to kill with impunity. It is our duty as brave Americans to strike down with finality any foe who dares frighten us. It is imperative that every true American has the authority to act without the stifling restrictions of law and order or due process. For too long, the forgotten men and women of America have cowered in fear of the other. I ask you to vote yes on HF 238 because it's time to stop being afraid. It's time to kill the scary people. It's time to make Minnesota lynch again. Right. Thank you. That, uh, Don't find that okay. All right. I'm not afraid. I'm, oh, no. I'm ceding my time. All right, to come on. You've been I'm good up until now. Yeah. yeah, that was rather offensive. But the last time we've had these hearings, if we shut anybody down on either side, we get booed and hissed. So I thought I'd just let them rave on. Go ahead. I'm ceding my time to Nancy Nord Benz. What's it? Okay. Ma'am, if you could uh, introduce yourself again. and uh, I'm Reverend Nancy nord Bentz, uh <laughs> new executive director of Protect Minnesota. Um, and mainly today, I just want to speak in response to the presence of John Lott here. Um, he has quite a national following, and I want to make sure that we all understand who just spoke with us. John Lott's deeply flawed research has been debunked repeatedly by respected academic researchers in public health, sociology, and criminal justice. Mr. Lott's frequent assertion that more guns equal more safety was thoroughly repudiated by a National Research Council panel as far back as 2004. When questioned about unlikely findings in a survey he claimed to have conducted in 1997, <coughs> Mr. Lott blamed a hard drive crash and an office move for his inability to produce the survey data, the names of any of his research assistants, and the names of the undergraduates who supposedly made the survey calls, or even the phone records showing that the survey calls had been made. Indeed, Mr. Lott has become such a pariah in academia that he was reduced to using an assumed name. He took the name of a Mary Roche um, so that he could make positive reviews of his own books on Amazon. This fraudulent effort earned Lott a page in the Encyclopedia of Liars and Deceivers by Rolf Bolt, published in 2014. I've given you that page in your handouts. Um, after losing face in academia, Mr. Lott founded and made himself president of the Crime Prevention Research Center, a pseudoscientific lapdog of the gun lobby. NRA board member and spokesman Ted Nugent is a secretary of his board of directors. None of his research should be given cred credence by the Minnesota House of Representatives, and I urge you to um, ignore it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for saying it. We all we don't really want to back and forth here. We're going to start no. off with the crack. But Mr. Chair, I just wanted to take a brief second and address the testimony from Mr. Kuhn. And I, that was not someone that I requested to be here and just wanted to make sure that everybody in the committee room uh, knew that. So, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Martins, uh, you were going to substitute someone? Oh, okay, that was it. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Uh, Imam Assad Zaman, and let me know if I pronounce that wrong, sir. Okay. That was fine. Mr. Chair, representatives, good morning. I am Imam Assad Zaman, Executive Director of the Muslim American Society of Minnesota. I come here today to urge you, to plead with you, and to beg you to reject Stand Your Ground, House File 238. I have carefully read this bill. The current law has a sentence that says, quote, the intentional taking of the life of another is not authorized by section 609.06, .06, except when necessary in resisting or preventing an offense. This bill would delete that sentence from law. I am pro-life, and I question how can anyone who is pro-life be in favor of deleting a law that says the intentional taking of the life of another is not authorized. 
This bill allows a person to shoot to kill simply because they feel, subjectively feel, quote, threatened. As an imam, as a clergy person, I can assure you all people are not rational at all times. <laughs> Some people feel threatened by a hijab. <clears throat> Some people feel threatened by a religious cap such as the one I am wearing or by a hoodie. Some people feel threatened when a person looks at them funny. Communities of color and immigrant communities are particularly fearful of this law, that it will be used as an open hunting season against them. An amazingly large number of innocent people of color have been shot and killed using the stand your ground laws across the nation. Till today, no one has shown me even one instance where a black person has shot and killed a white person and has escaped prosecution using a stand your ground defense. Is this bill racist in intent? Probably not. Is it racist in impact? Yes, definitely. Legislators? Sir, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Cindy Olson from Madison Lane. <coughs> To who? To the next, 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 next speaker. Okay, uh, Chantel Allen. And if I pronounce these names wrong, correct me when you come up. Good morning. Good morning, sir. No, that's, that was right, Chantel Allen. I'm with Black Lives Matter, St. Paul. Um, this same bill allowed for 17-year-old Trayvon Martin to be murdered and George Zimmerman to be free to continue to cause havoc on our society. How does this happen? Fear of a certain group of people, and specifically fear of black people. Whose fault is it that we're feared? Not black people's. It's the fault of our forefathers that needed to capitalize off black bodies by releasing Willie Lynch and making sure that every landowner ad adhered to that. It was our leaders during the Reconstruction that feared that the equal opportunity of blacks would bring, well, uh, what the equal opportunity for blacks would bring by releasing birth of a nation so that everyone across the nation could continue to fear black people. It was J. Edgar Hoover that feared our independence during the 60s and 70s, leading to execution of Dr. King and other great leaders that stood for civil, civil liberties of blacks by instill, having COINTELPRO. In today's age, we have the misrepresentation of Fox News and other media outlets. Fear of black people in this country is part of basically being patriotic. I'm a 43-year-old educator, and when I put this hood up, I'm feared. Passing a bill like this will create an open season purge on our community. Passing a bill like this will, cre will create mayhem in our streets. Laws and bills are supposed to be created to protect the rights of American citizens. Aren't we too citizens? Stand your ground is just another way for people to get away with murder. When the law reinforces these murders, then it becomes lynching. This is a Republican bill. Are you the party of Lincoln or the party of lynching? I oppose this bill. Thank you very much for your testimony, man. Thank you. Okay, we have John Thompson, uh, Fight for Justice. John, you here? I feel like I'm a family member here, man. I'm back again. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. Thanks for having me, uh, Mr. Cornish. Um, I want to coattail what my sister Chantel said. I, that is my sister. Um, I'm going to coattail what she said, but I want to put it a little blunt. You know, a lot of times you guys see me screaming and I'm yelling. You're like, who's that crazy man in here? And you confuse that with anger. It's passion. You won't see me in this room. You won't see me in this room opposing anything unless it has something to do with the oppression of my brothers and sisters. With that being said, House File, House File 238, with due, all due respect, sir, it protects cowards. Yes. This, this protects cowards like George Zimmerman. Yep. 
Officer Geronimo Yanez, Scarcella, and any one of these guys that fear for their life. Listen, when I'm screaming like this, I put you in fear for your life. I'm a dead man, and all I'm doing is showing passion. All right? So you have to understand the black man and understand where I'm coming from. And I, I challenge you to take, take time to sit down and, and, and understand me. Stop thinking that getting my passion confused with, with anger. I lost a friend. And the coward cop's fear for his life is what he said. Uh, they stood up and said, mere fear for your life is not going to work for you today, Officer Yanez. Somebody stood up and said that. All right? I'm in fear for my life. Every day I walk out of the house. You know how much hate mail I get? How many people call me nigger in my inbox? How many times people tell me they're going to kill you? And all I'm doing is coming here and I'm showing you passion. This is what the end of the road looks like as far as hope for a black man. This is what it looks like. It don't get no better than this. I know my two minutes coming up, man. But I'll be back. I'm your cousin. I'll be back. I'm your nephew. I'll be back. I'm your grandson. We may share different skin colors, but we bleed the same color blood, brother. And I think this is a bill that we need to sit down and discuss more and more before you put it out there. Because what you do is you give a coward a way out. And I'll leave you with this. I told my father a long time ago, I said, Dad, I want to go out and get a gun permit. I want to buy me a gun. And my dad said to me, he said, son, I want you to know the, the meaning of a gun. Before you make a gun purchase, the meaning and what it means to have a gun, the only reason you need a gun is to defend yourself. I'm 45 years old, man. I done talked my way out of so many butt whoopers, man. I don't need a gun. I promise you I don't. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we let you run over uh, there, so. <laughs> uh, Mr. Flaherty, the executive director of the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. <laughs> director Flaherty. Thank you again, Mr. Cornish, and for the record, Dennis Flaherty with the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. We simply want to go on record um, in opposition to this bill, um, and our, our tremendous concern about the bill is um, officer safety and, that it th and the threat that it uh, um, um, poses to all cops across the state. Every day uh, somewhere there are officers serving search and arrest warrants and they do so hoping to have the element of surprise on their side or as the bill refers to by stealth. We are concerned about the mentality that will be established by this bill. Language in it that says the use of deadly force is not authorized if the individual quote knows quote that the person is a peace officer is extremely troubling to us. Uh, I can give you one quick example. It may be about three years old, but we had an officer in St. Paul along with several of his colleagues that went in to arrest somebody. Uh, they were clearly in uniform, announced their arrival, screamed their arrival, and when they went through the door, they were met uh, with the individual they were looking for, but he was armed and immediately fired a shot at the first officer through the door. Fortunately, the officer was wounded and um, lives to tell the story, but that's, um, that's the way police operate uh, on these operations. Uh, we also do not like the major expansion on the definition of dwelling, which now is going to include garages, patios, and sheds, whether they're locked or unlocked, uh, boats, um, motorcycles. We're concerned about deadly force that's going to be used against people who represent no real threat or danger to an individual. And a simple 911 call would suffice. And finally, we, would, uh, we oppose how difficult this bill will be to wage a successful prosecution. Our colleagues from the county attorneys will, I'm sure, go in depth. But it would go from what would, what would a reasonable person do uh, to a very subjective standard of what they believed at the time. Uh, a standard, a prosecutor, unless he or she is a mind reader, is not going to be able to overcome. Thank you uh, for allowing me that time.
Thank you, Director Flaherty. And Jeff Edblad, Sandy County Attorney and President of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. And Mr. Backstrom, did you wish to testify this time? Yes, I do, Mr. Okay. You're next, and you're the final testimony. Go ahead, sir. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, again, my name is Jeff <coughs> Edblad. I'm the President of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning. While no one is more concerned about the safety and protection of Minnesota citizens than our state prosecutors in the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, a close look at the provisions of this proposal, as well as current law concerning the right of self-defense and the justified use of deadly force, leads us to conclude that this expansion is not only unnecessary, it would be harmful to efforts to prosecute dangerous criminals who commit violent <coughs> crimes because the way this bill is written, it would apply equally to dangerous criminals as it would to law-abiding citizens in situations that take place outside of the home. And I would concede the balance of my time to Mr. Backstrom. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Backstrom, we'll give you a couple of minutes. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. James Backstrom, Dakota County Attorney. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, <coughs> our current laws in Minnesota are adequate to protect our law-abiding citizens in terms of uh, exercising the right of self-defense. Today in Minnesota, a person may use deadly force without an obligation to retreat if it's done uh, to prevent the commission of a felony in their home. When a person's not in their home, they can rightfully protect themselves by using deadly force to avert a threat uh, of great bodily harm to themselves or another, provided they first attempt to avoid the danger if reasonably, reasonably possible. In all situations, Minnesota's law today properly requires that the decision to use deadly force be reasonable and necessary given the gravity of the danger faced. These current laws make common sense, they're appropriate, and they should not be expanded. One of the most significant changes that this law would bring is that it creates, as Mr. Flaherty indicated, a subjective standard of the reasonableness of a person's actions and using uh, deadly force rather than the objective standard under current law. In other words, the issue becomes what is in the mind of the person using deadly force rather than how a reasonable person would have reacted under the same circumstances. This law would allow a person to shoot first and ask questions <coughs> later whenever they believe they're exposed to substantial harm regardless of how a reasonable person would have responded under the same circumstances. Do we really want to encourage a driver who believes he's being threatened with substantial harm in a road rage incident to shoot and kill the other driver rather than calling 911 or simply driving away? I think not. Do we really want to presume that a homeowner has the right to shoot and kill an unarmed teenager who sneaks into their garage to steal a bicycle, as would, the case, as would be the case under this proposal? I think not. This law basically gives the citizens more rights to use deadly force then it would, then our law currently gives to police officers with less review. Mr. Backstrom, your time is up. So thank you for all of these reasons. I would encourage you uh, uh, not to support this bill. Thank you. Okay, we're going to start with member um, comments here or questions. We got quite a list in uh, session is at 12:15, but I'm going to real quickly begin. Uh, First of all, the veterans issue, there was many veterans. I, didn't, I hate to use veterans and say veterans say this and veterans say that. I don't think there's any survey out there in veterans and what they think about guns. I had many calls on the other side of the issue, uh, the supportive side, but I don't use that as a barometer. I have no idea if there's more one or more the other side. The other thing is the chiefs of police have um, uh, vehemently testified against every gun bill that I or anybody has ever brought up. The chief today seemed to support the permit to carry and gave a couple examples where it has worked. However, the chiefs, when the permit to carry was brought up years ago in 2005, vehemently opposed it and said blood would run in the streets, basically. So now I think they're learning that that's not true. And I think that they'll learn that if this law was enacted, it wouldn't be true either. So they're learning anyway. And the last one, um, I think that Mr. Backstrom completely mischaracterized this law and I'm very surprised at his testimony because this doesn't change the definition uh, of it. All it does is it changes the duty to retreat, but the other protections are still there and the reasonable person thing is still there. So I'm very surprised at that testimony compared to scholarly testimony. So that's my comments. We're gonna start out with Representative Newberger 
And uh, then we have probably four or five others. Representative Newberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say thank you uh, to Representative Nash for bringing this bill forward and allowing me to be a co-author on this bill. Um, very briefly, members, um, Article 4, Section 8 of the Minnesota Constitution requires us to take an oath of office to support the Constitution of the United States of America. That's the highest law of our land. Part of the highest law of our land is the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I highly, uh, I highly regard, I hold you in high regard, Representative Nash, for doing this. And I uh, firmly believe that House File 188 and House File 238 help us to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Representative Considine followed by Representative Dean. <coughs> Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm correct that you are the author, Mr. Chair, of the current Castle Doctrine bill? Well, we there is no current Castle Doctrine bill. The, I'm not the author of it. Um, I'm sorry, I, I was wrong about that. But then the first testifier that came up, I believe he was incorrect that current law does not require you to run out in 20 below zero, grab your children, and leave your premises when somebody breaks in your house. I believe at this point you are well within your rights to shoot that person. Um, so I was hoping that you would correct it, but I thought you were the, also thought you were the author. Thank you. Uh, Representative Dean, followed by Representative Becker, Finn, Lucero, and Pinto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to uh, express sort of my concern about some of the statements in some of the testimony. Uh, Dr. Lott came down and started putting forward all this racial stuff, uh, which quite frankly, you know, there's a saying that um, Mark Twain said, there are lies, damn lies, and then there are statistics. You can twist statistics any way you want to try to make a cogent argument. And most people that are good at it and uh, are trying to deceive people go straight to statistics. They don't even talk about the issue that's at hand. Um, and Representative Nash, you, you disavowed in many ways the, the testimony of Mr. Kuhn and that he wasn't someone that you invited to come and speak. But this bill and the previous bill give authorization to people like him, and people that think like him, to act on their own behalf out of fear, out of disgust, out of racism. We can go on down the list to shoot somebody and then make an argument. You give them the argument through this bill. And the last thing I want to comment on is, uh, Mr. Chair, your comments about driving around in Arizona with your gun on a bench and in your car and that that's not an issue. I just want to point out that you're a white man. You have, <laughs> hold on, uh, you have very different privilege in our society. We saw a young man that was recently shot by an officer in St. Paul, Philando Castile and Mr. Allen spoke to that point. And the point I will make is he had a permit to carry. He was telling the officer that he had a permit to carry and he was shot. If we get rid of permit to carry, does that mean that, you know, more people are going to be fearful when a cop's pulled over if they have a gun in the car? Or are officers going to use that in a way that, you know, well, how did I know he had a permit to carry? There was a requirement, and, and I believe that Representative Hillstrom pointed that out, is what are officers going to have to do? So philosophically, I'm against these bills, but also I think practically, there's big problems with what, this bills, what these bills do as far to carrying firearms in our society. And you reference Heller, Mr. Nash. Uh, Heller, uh, in the ruling, also pointed out it doesn't mean that it's uh, totally anybody, anywhere, any condition, anything can carry a gun. So, um, so yeah, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to be a representative and having to hear these types of bills when I believe there are much, much more important bills that deal with the safety of citizens in Minnesota. Um, and thank you for the time. Representative uh, Becker-Finn. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I wanted to thank um, Imam Zaman and Ms. Allen and Mr. Thompson for being here and uh, sharing your testimony with us today. I think it's very important that we hear from people of color when we're talking about these bills. Um, and uh, to to Dr. Mr. Uh, Dr. Lott, um, I think if uh, you're going to continue to speak so much about uh, Trayvon Martin and um, how much you care about protecting uh, blacks, that um, it might be helpful to speak more uh, with people like Mr. Thompson and Ms. Allen about the real effects and the way that the, the community actually sees these kinds of bills. Um, you know, telling them how they feel about it is not really productive and um, I think it's just really important to lift up the testimony of, of those folks today. So thank you. Um, if I could interject in there. I sent out an article. I think it was, I wish I could remember what it was called, but I th believe it was a Somali person here in St. Paul that was organizing people to defend themselves and showing them how to get permits to carry and was trying to uh, specifically people of color to get permits to carry. So that runs on both sides. Uh, Representative Lucero. Uh, thank no, I mean, as well as there are people that are for it, there are people that are against it. That's all I'm saying. Representative Lucero. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to briefly uh, thank Dr. John Lott for being here today. Uh, back when I was a truck driver, I used to listen to, to Dr. John Lott with uh, his comments on the then Jason Lewis show, now great congressman from the 2nd Congressional District, Jason Lewis. But uh, I wanted to thank him for cutting through all the hysteria to bring facts why pro-Second Amendment uh, bills such as this one that uh, Representative Nash is bringing forward is uh, uh, something that we should be in favor of to, to drive down crime. Thank you. I apologize to Representative Lott. Usually when somebody is disparaged like that, we rely, like in a courtroom, uh, a rebuttal. And unfortunately, we have no time for him to come down today and defend himself on his facts and his studies. All we had heard was a disparaging remarks were made about him. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, I guess I want to make sure we're really clear, um, as uh, County Attorney Baxter said, this represents a big change in this, uh, in the in self-defense in Minnesota. Um, all sorts of ways we could get into that, but just one specific situation. If your teenage son goes over and wants to meet his girlfriend on the on the deck of their house, uh, and her dad looks out the window and sees him, nobody else is out there. Um, that is a presumption. It doesn't matter whether there is a reasonable belief that there's an imminent threat of substantial bodily harm. If he entered that area by stealth, if he snuck onto the deck, um, there's a presumption that uh, the dad can kill him. Now we can think of lots of other situations, we get into that, but I guess the point is just um, the county attorneys are right. This is a major change in uh, major change in this. And, uh, and then the other point I just want to bring up, because the World Health Organization was referenced, I actually pulled up the homicide statistics, and just to confirm, um, the figure in the U.S. Is, uh, is way higher than, for example, any of the countries in Europe, except you really need to get pretty deep into the former Soviet Union before you get anywhere close to the homicide levels in the U.S. And as long as we're lifting up the World Health Organization, in that very same page, they say one of the main drivers of homicide rates is access to guns, with, with approximately half of all homicides come of the firearm. So I appreciate the reference to the World Health Organization. I think that they should lead the way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, we'll let Representative Nash close. Representative Nash, uh, in your closing, could you let us know if all hell is broken loose in any of the states that have enacted the, the uh, uh, permitless carry or if uh, what's going on there in those well, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for a very spirited and, and good debate. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, share issues that are important to me and members on in my caucus. It's, it is a, a great opportunity for us to have conversation. I believe firmly that self-defense is a human right. It doesn't know anything about color. It doesn't know anything about geography. Uh, we each have an individual right to defend ourselves. And that is a very important thing that we need to note. And that, for that reason, so we can clarify the rules of engagement here in the state of Minnesota, that is why we have this bill. Uh, and with that, I thank you. All right, uh, it took us five years or so to pass the permit to carry, and we'll work on this one until we get her done. Thank you very much. Meeting adjourned, and the bill will be held over for possible inclusion.